Welcome once again to Newswire Los Angeles. I am your host, Attorney Jamie Wright. We are doing a special interview for the district attorney's race, and we are doing a sit-down interview with Chief Deputy District Attorney Jackie Lacey, who is a candidate for this office. So stay tuned for this interview, and thank you. Hi, and welcome to Newswire LA. I'm your host, Chin Thomas Hangsey. As we said earlier, this election on November 6th is proving to be a very interesting one, especially when it comes to the district attorney's race. What I want to do is give you a recap of what happened on June 5th, because what happened that day actually sets the stage for what's going to happen in November. So let's take a look at some graphics, which are coming up right about now. I'm going to take a look at the race from the bottom up. I want to start with the person in the sixth position, John L. Brialt III. John L. Brialt is an assistant district attorney in the office. In fact, with the exception of Carmen Trutanich, everyone in this race is a member of the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. John L. Brialt III captured 27,695 votes, and that accounts for 3.45% of the total votes cast on that day. John L. Brialt got into the race very late. In fact, he got in so late that he was unable to set up a website for himself or his campaign. Finishing above him in the fifth position is ADA Bobby Grace. Bobby Grace captured 42,009 votes, accounting for 5.23% of the total votes cast. Finishing very far ahead of Bobby Grace in the fourth position is Danette E. Myers. Danette E. Myers captured 108,271 votes for 13.47% of the votes cast on that day. Now, as we get into the top three, this is where it gets really interesting. Finishing in third place is Los Angeles City Attorney Carmen Trutanich. This was truly a surprise, and as we talk about the last three candidates, we'll tell you why. Los Angeles City Attorney Carmen Trutanich got 179,095 votes, accounting for 22.28% of the total votes cast that day. What's so interesting is that Carmen Trutanich has probably the most name recognition of any candidate on this list. In fact, he's the sitting Los Angeles City Attorney. And also, he spent the most money in this particular race. Moving into the second position is Alan Jackson. He captured 190,792 votes for 23.74% of the total votes cast on that day. What's really surprising about this, and I think Alan will tell you in his own words, was that everyone, not just him, not just Carmen Trutanich, not just some people in the media, everybody thought this was going to be a Jackson-Trutanich race. And that's how Jackson programmed his media, his on-air media campaign. For every Carmen Trutanich commercial, there was an Alan Jackson commercial right behind it. And it seemed to be the strategy at the time. But we're going to take a look right now at the top of the list. Jackie Lacey. Jackie Lacey captured 255,831 votes for 31.83% of the total votes cast on that day. And this is the major surprise of the day because Jackie Lacey had no media presence, especially on TV and radio. But she came out of the shadows and took that first place. So this, this is going to mark a significant strategy change for challenger Alan Jackson. And so now that you know what happened on June 5th, I'm going to throw it over to my colleague, Jamie Wright. Good morning, Mrs. Lacey. How are you? 
Good morning, Jamie. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for stopping to talk to us. We appreciate it and inviting us into your home. You're welcome. I have a couple questions for you. The first being, as an attorney and someone who went to law school, obviously the degree is very versatile. What prompted you to go into public service and join the DA's office? Well, I uh, would love to say that uh, I knew what I was getting into before I started, but uh, my first job, Jamie, was working for a very small firm that did entertainment law. And I was stuck in an office one day uh, doing depositions where they were asking the same questions over and over again. And I thought, you know what, this is boring. I, I, I can't do this for the rest of my life. And a friend told me about a position that was open at the Santa Monica City Attorney's Office as a prosecutor. And I applied and got in and uh, really to escape my, my other job. But then I learned that this was really what I was supposed to do, that I was born to be a trial lawyer, to be a prosecutor. And that's really how it happened for me. Okay. And what does it mean to be born to be a trial attorney or a prosecutor? Well, I, I, I think that uh, my view is that we're all here for, for a particular purpose in life. Uh, and uh, we're all here to serve in some capacity. For me, once I found, um, once I got into the DA's office, which is what I did after I left the Santa Monica City Attorney's Office, I discovered that I really enjoyed uh, criminal law, that I enjoyed um, doing this kind of work, and that I was good at it. And those two combinations of things led me to believe that uh, there was something about my personality, my background, my DNA that worked well with prosecuting cases. Okay. And so let's talk a little bit about your role in the DA's office. You currently serve as the Chief Deputy District Attorney? I am the Chief Deputy, yes. Okay. And so how do you think that role will help you when you are, or if you're elected to become the DA of Los Angeles County? Well, I think it's not just the role I have now, Jamie, but it's the um, the six or seven roles that I've held in the office. Mm -hmm. I started off in a, as a trial attorney, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I've tried 60 felony cases, and I've handled everything from uh, drug cases to domestic violence to uh, gang cases to homicide cases, and I obtained the first hate crime murder conviction rate in the, um, for a race in LA County history. But in the last 12 years, I've supervised as director the largest part of one section of the office, the downtown office. I've supervised special units, which include sex crimes, major crimes, which are high profile cases, um, the juvenile division. I've been the assistant DA of line operations, which is all of our offices out in the branches. And now I've been the chief deputy. Uh, for the last part. So I have a variety of experiences to draw from. My uh, background and experience is vast in terms of knowledge of the office. And I also know the people mm -hmm. because I have to evaluate them as the chief deputy because I have to know who they are and what their talents and strengths are in order to assign them to their proper places. I know the culture of the folks as well as the people as well as everything about the business end of the office. Okay, so let's talk about your role as a manager. Um, one of the things that your opponent seems to really be honing in on is the fact that managerial skills, or even as he calls it, bureaucratic um, skills, are not what are a major asset to becoming the DA. How would you respond to that criticism or discussion? Well, first of all, the skills that I have are not uh, bureaucratic skills. Uh, they are not administrative skills. Um, the chief deputy is an executive officer. In other words, I set policy and the policy gets carried out by others. Uh, the district attorney of LA County, the last few that have been elected, I know them, mm -hmm. and they are not going to court. Mm -hmm. They are about running the business of this office so that the, the 1,000 lawyers that we have can do their job. Mm -hmm. And while it is good to have experience in the courtroom and valuable, and I have that, mm -hmm. uh, in order to understand how to motivate, inspire, train lawyers and support them, you have to know a lot about the business end of it. If the, district, if the elected district attorney of LA County is going into court, which this one never has uh, since he's been DA, nor has his predecessor, mm -hmm. something's wrong. Okay. 
And that's why that's a myth to think that, well, I'm, I'm fresh from the courtroom, so I'm nearly to jump up okay. the ladder seven ranks and run the office. Okay, okay. And so with that then, coming, someone who's coming fresh from the courtroom and you being in an executive position, do you still consider yourself a true prosecutor? And if so, what does that mean? I am a true prosecutor. Okay. You know, not every prosecutor is assigned to work in courts. Um, all of us, by definition, are prosecutors, and certainly the elected official is a prosecutor. Uh, what I think it means to be a true prosecutor is to be one who is committed career-wise mm -hmm. to making sure that justice is done, one who understands criminal law and criminal procedure, and one who uh, is committed to making sure that public safety remains number one in our office. And I have demonstrated that. And so I am the real prosecutor. Okay. Well, let's transition into your campaign a little bit. Um, in the June primary, it appeared as if you were a little more low-key, whereas some of your opponents had really aggressive television commercials, a lot of mailers. Uh, what was your campaign strategy in June? In June, we had a very um, simple and sound strategy. We believed uh, in the voters. Mm -hmm. We trusted that the media would get our message out. Uh, I knew that I had much more knowledge and experience than anyone else running about how to run the office. Mm -hmm. And our strategy was very simple. We knew um, that um, uh, if we raised enough money to support our strategy to get the message out to the small pool of voters who actually voted in the primary, that we would win. We also felt that people would understand what a chief deputy was. And uh, we all, I also knew that uh, getting the endorsement of the Los Angeles Times, the Daily News, the Los Angeles Sentinel, mm -hmm. and all of these other small newspapers that deliver papers to everybody's house sure. uh, in the morning, or for those people who log on, uh, would be influential. And so when I woke up on May 13th, Mother's Day of this year, mm -hmm. and saw we had swept every newspaper endorsement that was possible, I felt we, we were rolling into, um, into a, a victory. And uh, I'm very grateful for it. I'm grateful to the voters that they got it right. Okay. So now moving into the November election and, you know, being aware of your opponent's strategy, which will, you know, he has said, I can outraise the other campaign. I'm going to continue to be, you know, very aggressive in putting my face out there to a public. How will your strategy change or adjust in order to combat that? Well, I had always hoped, Jamie, uh, right after the primary, that we would be able to just stick with the issues and qualifications. Mm -hmm. And I still hope that, mm -hmm. because I think uh, when you start to see negative campaigning, you don't do a, a service, uh, you do a disservice to the public, and uh, you don't inform them of the issues that they really need to be informed about, and it gets very nasty. And people have time and time again said uh, they don't like negative politics. But here's my strategy. My opponent can raise and do whatever he wants to do, mm -hmm. but we have clear focus over the next uh, you know, few days about this election, and that is that um, we're gonna we are sweeping the endorsements, mm -hmm. okay? We are, we are knocking him out of the endorsements, period. Uh, I've got law enforcement behind me. I've got some of the top leaders in the county and the state mm -hmm. are saying that I am the most qualified person to assume that position. And um, we have incredible faith mm -hmm. in the voters once again that they will see who the real prosecutor and who the real DA of LA County should be. Okay. So in November, you know, it's possible that you could be the first African American woman to hold this position, which would be historic. Do you think the fact that you're on a ballot with Barack Obama, who in 2008 became the first African-American president, will work to your advantage? Well, I don't know is the, is, 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 is the answer. Okay. I don't know. Um, I, I realize that being the first African-American, the first woman candidate for that office, bears with it a great responsibility mm -hmm. that there are, there are girls, there are young women who are going to be looking at me and saying, you know what, in the future, I could do something like that. And so I realize it's important for me to understand um, the obligation to be a role model, mm -hmm. to conduct myself at all times in an honorable, professional manner. 
And I welcome the opportunity because I was inspired by great women that I saw when I was young, the Shirley Chisholms of the world that sometimes we forget. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, there are others uh, that we look at and we think the judges that have gone before me. And uh, we look at them and we, as, as children and as young people and say, you know what, um, there's something about that person's personality or there's something about that person that makes me believe that I can achieve. Uh, and so I think it's extremely important, but I also remind voters that it's important to vote for the most qualified person and that's where my strength lies. I have so much more experience than my opponent. Okay. Uh, I am his boss's boss's boss. Okay, that's how much more experience and how much more responsibility I have mm -hmm. now, and uh, that's what makes me the best choice for this position. Okay, let's talk about choice and the voters. Of course, voters can be a little finicky. Um, they're sometimes uncertain, and one of the things that your opponent has kind of pushed. Um, in terms of an issue that he has with you and your campaign is that sometimes it seems as if you can't make your decisions on your own and mm -hmm. you completely reflect the current sitting DA. Mm -hmm. How will you kind of prove to the voters that these are decisions that I'm making based on policy choices that reflect the law mm -hmm. and what is best for LA County being that it is so diverse? Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, you have to understand the decisions that have been made under District Attorney Steve Cooley over the last year, 12 years I've been at the table with input, mm -hmm. and I have, um, you know, I have my own uh, views. I have no problem expressing them. Okay. And so to say that, well, um, to say those things is inaccurate, Jamie. Okay. Um, alternative sentencing, which has been something I have talked about time and time again, is something that I have been a part of creating. That is not. Uh, necessarily uh, something that uh, the district attorney, uh, you know, he has allowed me to take a leadership role in that, but I have my own ideas and own views about uh, the justice system. Many of them, uh, and, and when you think about it, so does Mr. Jackson, you know, when you're talking about three strikes, the three strikes policy, he also agrees with the current district attorney. Mm -hmm. And so that isn't to say that either one of us is an independent. Mm -hmm. I'm very independent, I'm very, um, uh, uh, I am very thoughtful, mm -hmm. though, about my decisions. I don't just make them for political purposes, I don't make off-the-cuff remarks or decisions, and I spend time thinking about it, and I also seek the input of people around me. Okay. Well, as a follow-up to that, and let's use three strikes as an example. Um, in the case where your office, say, has a policy and the public doesn't necessarily agree with how the law has kind of come into fruition, and in rhetoric, the politicians don't agree either, do you stick to the policy of the office or do you change your decision based on public opinion? I think you listen to the public to, to a certain degree, Jamie, because they elect you and they elect you to do a good job. And mm -hmm. certainly, uh, they're members of the public uh, who have good points. But your call, my call as the uh, top prosecutor mm -hmm. in the DA's office is to follow the law and do what's right. In uh, three strikes, our office of the last 12 years has got it right. We are not setting, sending people away for petty crimes for life. And right now there is a ballot initiative that would make what we've been doing uh, happen statewide. Mm -hmm. And I have said I support it. My opponent has said he doesn't. And there's a conflict there because at one point you can't say that you agree with the office policy because it's fair and it's right, but you don't want it to uh, be in effect throughout the state of California. If it's fair and right here in LA County, why isn't it fair and right in the entire state? And um, I, I, I do believe that that but this is one of the most uh, distinguishing points of myself and my opponent, really the courage to sort of say, uh, as a prosecutor, the law should be fair. Okay. Um, another distinguishment here is that your opponent has said he's a law enforcement partner. Um, he has also talked about rank and file officers supporting him and you've gotten quite a bit of the large associations. I know the Protective League endorsed you as well as the Association of the LA County Sheriff's Deputies. Why do you think there is a difference in 
the rank and file versus larger associations and whom they support? Well, I think there is a misnomer here. First of all, okay. PPL does represent the rank and file okay. of the LAPD, okay. which is the, one of the largest law enforcement agencies uh, in LA County. ALATS, the, the Association of Deputy Sheriff, they represent the rank and file. Mm -hmm. um, Cali you haven't mentioned California Narcotics Officers Association. Um, it, is, uh, it represents the rank and file of officers who dedicate their lives to prosecuting narcotics cases. Uh, and those endorsements are very important. Uh, before those uh, agencies endorsed, we went through extensive questioning. They went through an extensive background check of both candidates. And notwithstanding my uh, opponent's claim, they chose me. And so I'm really st uh, proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with the rank and file officers who work in LA County on a daily basis. Okay. Let's move a little bit into the issues. Um, I know one of the things that I read in the LA Times is that you want to reinvigorate the Environmental Crimes Division. How will you do that and how will you reallocate resources in you know a county that has a strict budget in order to do so in your office? Mm -hmm. Well, there are a couple of things. Uh, one, we need to add, uh, I intend to add more prosecutors and more investigators to the unit. Uh, we, we've been going through strict budgetary mm -hmm. uh, times for a long time, actually since 2000 when I came on board as Director of Central Operations. Um, what I will do differently is build upon what we've done. A lot of people don't know the great work that uh, the current Environmental Crimes Unit has done. For instance, you may not know that last year they collected more fines based on environmental crimes uh, committed in LA County in the history of, of the unit. But I do believe that uh, as the district attorney, I will be uh, a little bit more vocal and interface with the environmental crimes uh, groups that are interested in seeing our office, seeing what our office does and protecting the environment. Okay. And then realignment is an issue. Um, there are going to be a lot of, you know, prisoners that are coming out of state jails and coming into local jails. How will you deal with this in terms of public safety and ensuring that your DAs are prepared to handle if there is an influx of crime in the county? We're already engaged in training of law enforcement and DAs mm -hmm. on um, the new law, the new laws, because with one law it actually affected more than 70 sentences mm -hmm. for different crimes. Uh, we already have established a unit to do uh, parole violation hearings, which is something that the district attorney's office never did before. Mm. In the future, what I hope to do is, first of all, be an advocate for more resources uh, to come our way um, with realignment. The governor did promise that if he shifted this responsibility to the counties, that he would give us more uh, money, more resources. And so I expect uh, for him to honor that promise. But more importantly, I think I'm going to have to prioritize. And uh, because we don't have the space in the county jail, it's very overcrowded, as well as the state prison. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that those criminals who are violent and who are a threat to our society continue to go and continue to be punished adequately. But I also, on the lower end of the spectrum, want to see us take more advantage of alternative sentencing courts, such as drug courts or mental health courts, our courts for our veterans. I think those use of those courts can be expanded and would help to leave more room in the county jail for um, and the state prison for the more violent criminals. Okay. And Kamala Harris, the Attorney General, has endorsed you, and she has a big rehabilitation stance in terms of uh, criminals and, you know, recidivism. How will you advocate for resources or what tools will you use as the DA um, in order to get resources to, you know, if they're nonviolent criminals, give them a second chance or put them in a program? Like what, what will be the tools that you'll use? Well, it's the tools that are already in existence. I would expand on them. I've been a part of the team that has created alternative sentencing courts, mm -hmm. reentry courts for women. Um, what I find works best mm -hmm. is that um, if we think that a defendant coming before the court would be a good, uh, would, would do well on probation, 
uh, we would place uh, lower level offenders on probation, have a judge monitor them, have them come back on a regular basis, and uh, ensure that they get the resources and the help that they, that they need. And I think that's really the key uh, to this. Uh, the Attorney General has done a great job with uh, the truancy program. Remember when she was in San Francisco? We have something like that. Okay. We we'll really try to encourage kids to stay in school from the get-go because I think that you've got to have some crime prevention programs also as a DA. So we have the truancy program. We have also uh, something called Project LEAD, which I'm a uh, facilitator in Project LEAD where we go out and volunteer in an elementary school one uh, hour a week mm -hmm. and we teach kids about why it's important to stay in school, listen to their parents, stay out of gangs, stay away from drugs, why graffiti is wrong, why piracy is wrong, why um, uh, and what can happen to you. We also at one point were able to take them to juvenile hall so they can see this is where you could end up if uh, you do break the law. And so I think that program is very effective and I think having prosecutors meet people for the first time in a classroom um, it gives a, a positive image to our office that we are interested in uh, making sure that uh, people stay out of the system as opposed to reacting when they come in. But you've only seen the first half of what Chief Deputy District Attorney Jackie Lacey had to say. So make sure you tune in next week for part two of a riveting interview with Chief Deputy District Attorney Jackie Lacey on the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Race 2012. Stay tuned. Stay tuned for more news on this Westlake Signal Station.